The Conversation Hour with Richard Feidler. Richard Feidler with you this morning. My guest in conversation this morning is a man who says that big war is not dead, it's just gone on holidays. Gwyn Dyers, a military historian who has served with the navies of Britain, the US and his native Canada. He stirred controversy in his new book, Future Tense, by arguing that the US under the Bush administration has become in his words, a rogue nation, and it needs to quickly return to cooperation with the broader international community. Gwyn Dyer, welcome to the Conversation Hour. Thank you, Richard. Gwyn, I read a story on you in a US newspaper that said, Gwyn Dyer isn't exactly a wimp, not many guys from Newfoundland are, which was <laughs> an interesting way to start a story on you, I thought. You are from that uh, remote part of, of Canada. Was it yes. a, did you grow up in a military family? No, I didn't. I grew up in a family who were partly sort of fishermen, and one or two of us had risen above our origins and become civil servants in my father's generation. <laughs> but, I mean, you can think of it as a sort of Canadian tassy, actually. A Canadian um, tassy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there are a lot of Newfoundland jokes as well in Canada, aren't there? Oh, there, there are, yeah. yes. I'm, I, I don't know of any Tasmanian jokes, but I know a great many Newfoundland. They all involve you being extremely stupid. <laughs> it's a bit like that here, I'm afraid. But uh, were you, you weren't expected then to serve in the armed forces. There wasn't that military t- tradition. So what drew you in there to the to Oh, uh, well, this thereby hangs a tale, which I'm not sure I want to go too far into. But let's put it this way. When I was... 17, the police in my hometown took the view that my remaining best option career-wise was to leave Newfoundland and join the Navy. <laughs> uh, so you're, you're a bit of a, a, a colourful young man then in that sense. Well, I suppose so, at least uh, stupid. <laughs> now, you ended up serving with three different navies. Were you trying to find one you liked, Gwyn? Well, I guess in a way I was, um, although I was actually, I mean, there's a... I remember some captain I once served with was famous for writing sort of fitness reports on on officers and um, allegedly had once said that this officer only uses my ship as transportation between brothels. Um, (laughs) Now, I I wasn't quite doing that, you understand, but it was getting me round the planet. So what took you from the Canadian Navy to where? The, the British Navy, Well, I, I went to America first. I went to the States. I was there for, so in the 60s, actually. Um, good place to be at the time. And, uh, but uh, I was at the same time sort of working my way out of the Navy. And, and, you know, I mean, I like ships, but the Navy is a horse's ass, really. Um, and uh, so how do you sort of get yourself out of this into something more interesting and lucrative that keeps you moving around the planet? Um, so, you know, lacking any other alternatives, I decided I'd become an academic. So I persuaded the Navy to send me to graduate school in America, doing war studies and things like that. Um, and then I went and taught in the Canadian Staff College for a couple of years. And then I persuaded the Navy to send me to, well, I actually went, by then I was free to leave, but I needed the money, so I stayed in the reserve and went to Britain and drove minesweepers there for years um, while getting a PhD. And then, of course, I became a journalist and had to hide the fact that I have a PhD evermore, because they, <laughs> they think people with PhDs will work for free. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, we're not paying you a cent to be on the conversation. It's not a penny. <laughs> it's really disgusting. I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> it's Richard Feidler with you this morning. My guest is military historian, broadcaster, and author of the new book, Future Tense, Gwyn Dyer, and he's an academic and he works for free, which is terrific. Uh, <laughs> Gwyn, none, nonetheless, uh, even though the Navy was clearly a, a springboard for you to get out of uh, your, your humble origins, if you like, in, in Newfoundland, you, you've remained deeply fascinated by the practice of war all your life. Is there something yeah. about war that has always troubled you? I troubled, this, I mean, suggests that I'm haunted by these worries about the human condition, and I'm not, actually. Um, it is an extreme environment. You cannot think of a more extreme environment. And there is something fascinating about that. People behave very differently, both better and worse in this sort of environment than you will ever see them behave in ordinary life. Um, I'm not a war junkie. Many colleagues of mine, I suppose, are in a way, but I don't rush off to every war. I can, I can miss quite a few and not miss them at all. Um, but it isn't, it's, it, you know, first of all, it's fascinating to be there. I mean, it's physically fascinating how your own body reacts even. Um, 
But beyond that, uh, it is this enormous institution which we feed with enormous amounts of money and effort and um, de de devoted to destruction, uh, simply, purely destruction. Um, with all sorts of rationalizations attached, of course. But, you know, that's how this one works. It destroys things. Um, and it drives the people in it to do things they are not, I think, in the vast majority of cases, normally inclined or even willing to do. I mean, one of the things that we have come to understand about war, for example, in the last 50 years, is that when you persuade men, mostly men, uh, to kill in combat, and you do it through basic training, and you lay down the reflex pathways, and you fill their minds with you know enemy images and dehumanize the enemy, and you trick them into doing it, it doesn't mean they forgive themselves for doing it. And that's why you get this huge post-combat, you know, traumatic stress stuff. Well, let's, let's um, talk a bit about that. I, I, last yeah. year, your book, War, the, the Lethal Custom, was re-released. This is considered by many people to be a classic in the field of uh, military history. And it was full of some extraordinary re revelations for me when I read it, particularly on this issue of basic training you're speaking about there. Now, soldiers must be in the business of killing. There's, there's no getting around that, is there? No. But, but no. how difficult is it to train ordinary men, ordinary human beings, into soldiers who are prepared to actually pick up a gun, shoot it, and kill someone? Well, it's actually much more difficult than the armies realized for a long time. I mean, I, I think there was a point in the ancient past when battles were fought in, in sort of rank shoulder to shoulder and you had a spear or a sword and you had to slash the guy in front of you and your, com your comrades would notice if you weren't holding your end up and slashing away. But as soon as firearms uh, become reasonably accurate and the battle, the dispersion starts in the battlefield and you're not standing in ranks anymore, you're hiding in a foxhole or something, it becomes possible for people not to kill. And it turns out that about 98% of them don't want to kill. There is a tiny percentage of people who don't mind killing, but the vast majority of us have huge reservations about this, moral reservations, even physical revulsion. Now, now there was, and, you do in your book refer to a study yeah. that was done after the Second World War by uh, 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 SLA Marshall. General Marshall. General SLA Marshall, Marshall yeah. Um, well, I mean, basically, he was a, he was a, he'd fought in the First World War. He was far too old for the Second, so they made him head, head of the Office of Military History, and he sent out teams of historians, you know, in tin hats, um, to do immediate post-combat -com interviews with infantry companies. And uh, they interviewed each individual in separately, and then they interviewed, did a group debrief as well. And, and what they discovered, to their complete astonishment, was that, generally speaking, only about 15% of the people in the company who had rifles or whatever were shooting them to kill. A larger proportion would shoot in the air. More than half wouldn't shoot at all because they weren't observed. They, didn't, you, you know, they could let the side down without being caught at it, and they just couldn't bring themselves to kill. They didn't run away. They weren't cowards. They stayed there, and many of them presumably died there, but they would not kill. Now, was this true for just the U.S.? Army. Well, if it if it had been true for just the U.S. Army, we'd have lost the war, wouldn't we? I mean, you know, I'm assuming it was true for the German Army, too. Um, and uh, then they went back subsequently and discovered that this had actually been going on for a long time, that even in, in uh, the American Civil War, half the muskets f picked up from the battlefield, or more, in fact, more than half, were loaded but not fired. Now, I mean, the routine is you load it, you fire, it takes you a minute to reload it, you immediately fire again. There shouldn't be more than 10% loaded when they're dropped by somebody who ran away or died. And in fact, more than half of them are loaded. Some of them were loaded up to six times because you couldn't avoid going through the motions of loading. That would be noticed. Um, people were, and, and then they did experiments and they stood a sort of Prussian infantry battalion from Frederick the Great's time, or, you know, modern people bearing those weapons in that formation and had them fire at essentially a large sheet representing the frontage of a, an opposing infantry battalion at the average range of engagement of an 18th century battle. Now, I mean, these are the dregs of the earth, right? The, you know, the 18th century armies, drunks and, and, and fugitives from justice who are whipped daily and they're standing in ranks, and they're firing at another group of similar people from some other country standing, let's say, 60, 80 meters away. 
And when they fired at the sheet, there should be 90% casualties in the facing battalion because all the bullets hit. But in real life, there'd be 10% because even then they were shooting in the air to avoid killing people. What does, so, what does this uh, tell us about human nature then? Well, it, it tells us something rather encouraging, which is that we are right. not, in fact, natural-born killers. However, the armies, having once discovered this, thereupon set themselves to solve the problem, the problem being our soldiers aren't killing people. So then you get the, the new format of training that comes in around the time of, well, it comes in by the Korean War, and already the firing rates are going up. By Vietnam, there are 85% of people are shooting to kill. And what they do is they basically stop doing these, you know, long grassy fields where you fire at a bullseye, and you do pop-up targets, and they disappear after a second, and if you haven't fired by then, you're... you're punished, you know, um, so reflex pathways, and meanwhile fill their heads with, um, you know, enemy images, demonize the enemy, dehumanize them, tell them very explicitly that it's okay to kill, and they'll do it for you. But this And then they'll spend... But this, this affects a, a long-term toll, though, on soldiers, as you say. Oh, yeah. Then they spend the rest of their lives feeling guilty about what they have done, though they were tricked into doing it, um, which is why almost certainly, post-combat trauma, stress, PTSD, um, is far, far higher in modern wars than it was in the first or the second world war. Um, I mean, we are having rates of alcoholism, suicide, health breakdown, and so on among veterans completely unseen in the second world war. And the reason is they didn't get tricked into killing people. Most of them didn't kill anybody. Richard Feidler with you in conversation this Wednesday morning with journalist and author Gwyn Dyer. The Conversation Hour with Richard Feidler. Gwyn, uh, Gwyn Dyer, you, you talk about this process, this new process of basic training as, as needing to bypass the moral censor in, in the, the, the trainees. Is this something that's now been more wide, uh, widely adopted by other armies as well? Western armies. Um, if you want to know the main reason, this is the dirty little secret, when Western armies fight non-Western armies, you know, the Americans invade Iraq or something, um, all of our soldiers or their soldiers are trained to kill. And the poor old Iraqis are still operating under the normal human handicaps with 80% of them unwilling to kill anybody. So, of course, quite apart from, you know, the fact that we've got these air forces dropping bombs on them and things, the poor guys don't actually try to kill us. We just kill them. Um, so Western armies have a combat superiority over armies that have not adopted this format, a form of training, which is completely unheard of. I mean, it, was, it wasn't that way. You know, in 18th century India, if you trained a bunch of Indians to be infantry and you put a bunch of British soldiers up against them, they'd come out about even. Um, well, I think the Indian Army actually has got the, the message and does do training this way. But if you deal with sort of real third world armies where they haven't actually picked up on the latest thoughts of, of, of the military profession, it's like a hot knife through butter if you put a, a Western Army against them because our guys kill. What what answer is there to this, Gwinda? I'm just thinking this, we, we we can't beat around the bush here. We actually need our soldiers to to shoot to kill, don't we? That's what we hire them for. That is what we hire them for. And I am not an anti-soldier person. I'm not even a pacifist. <laughs> but um, I do actually find a great many of the uses to which we put our soldiers illegitimate and unfair to them. And I think we owe them a great deal more duty of care than we generally observe in the situations that we put them into. But well, Winston, no, I, yeah. Winston Churchill once famously said that war, which was once cruel and glorious, has become cruel and sordid. And he was talking about the Second World War, which we now look upon as a, as a, a kind of a, a great heroic conflict, if you like. How do you think he would be describing 21st century warfare at the moment? Oh, I think he would say cruel and sordid. I mean, you know, but on the other hand, I don't think it was ever really very glorious. The stink is always there. You write in your, your history of war uh, that big war is not dead. It's just on a holiday. What did you mean by that? Well, we do assume, um, after particularly the end of the Cold War, that 
history is over. I mean, we may not agree with dear old Francis Fukuyama. It's, you know, history came to an end in 1989. But in a sense, we do think that we're out of those woods and we will never see them. The great powers will never again end up facing each other across a an armed trench. Um, on our, you know, an armed, an armed frontier. Um, they will never again threaten each other with nuclear weapons. Little countries, backwoods countries, Iraqs and Irans and North Koreas may be a problem, but we're never going to see the Chinese and the Americans square off, or the Russians and the Chinese, or the Europeans and the Russians, or whatever. Well, Russians are Europeans, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it doesn't seem the that, way to the Europeans sometimes, does it? Well, sometimes. <laughs> but I, mean, I spend lots of time in Russia. It's European, I, I promise you. But, but no, there, there is this general assumption that that's over. And I can see no reason whatever to assume it's over. It's definitely gone away for the moment and how happy I am that it has done. Um, but I don't think we can assume that with no effort or attention on our part, it will stay away forever. I think it might be persuaded not to come back, but it requires constant attention because we are living in a very fortunate but not necessarily very stable situation where no great power sees any other as an enemy. Will that last? I don't know, but I don't like the way some things are going. When in your new book, Future Tense, you begin with a very provocative statement indeed, and I'll just, just read it very briefly. The United States needs to lose the war in Iraq as soon as possible. What is at stake now is the way we run the world for the next generation. It's an amazingly provocative statement. Have you copped some flack for that? Oh, oh a little bit. Yeah, a when they bit. had me on the Fox network, it was a bit exciting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the... What, Fox went oh, after well. you for saying that, did they? I find that hard oh, to yeah, well, and they, yeah, they, well, actually, they, they, I can't remember the guy's name now, but there's one commentator on Fox who's their sort of tame lefty. That is to say, he's somewhat to the left of Genghis Khan. And um, so, I mean, I didn't actually get dismembered. They just stabbed me a few times. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's all good fun. I mean, they, you know, words can't hurt you. But uh, yeah, all right, it's provocative, but it, I, I mean every word of it. Uh, why, you know, why does the United States need to lose the war to keep the world safe and stable? Because in my opinion, my conclusion, uh, the principal reason for the United States invading Iraq had nothing to do with alleged terrorist links, which of course there were none of, or alleged weapons of mass destruction, likewise none of. Um, it was a project that the people who are now running American foreign policy, the so-called neoconservatives, you know, Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice, Paul Wolfowitz, Richard Hatt, Steve Hadley, that lot, um, run American defense and foreign policy for the last five years. This is their project since long before they even got back into office in 2001. They were writing about invading Iraq and writing about it as the launch vehicle for their project to take the world over. With the best of intentions, of course, understand that they wish the best for us all. But they are convinced that American power is the solution to the world's problems, that a, that a combination of American military and economic power and the attraction of American ideals can transform the planet. And all that is required to get rid of all the bad guys and bring peace, justice, prosperity, and whatnot to the dark corners of the world, as Mr. Bush likes to call them, is that everybody else get out of the way, stop hat tying us down with your stupid international rules and your idiot United Nations, and let uh, give us a clear field of fire and we'll fix it. The Conversation Hour with Richard Feidler. Richard Feidler with you this morning, a very provocative and challenging conversation hour this morning, courtesy of my guest, Gwyn Dyer, who's a broadcaster, a military historian, and author of his new book called Future Tense. Gwyn Dyer, in your book you describe the United States as a rogue nation. What, what do you mean by that? Well, it's decided that it not only has the right to break all the rules, that in the service of a higher cause, it is its duty to break the rules. And breaking the rules is what makes you a rogue. And the rules I'm talking about are the rules we created in 1945 so we wouldn't have any more world wars. Um, you know, thou shalt not attack thy neighbor. Full stop. It's over. 
It is against the law to attack another country. It never was before 45. It was perfectly legitimate. Have a go, see if you win. But it's against the law. We created this whole structure with the UN at its top, the Security Council and so on, in order to stop the process of great powers going to war every 50 years or so in a sort of massive scrum, everybody in, because it had got so destructive with the new weapons that we couldn't afford to go on doing it. I mean, we killed... What? About 50 million people in the Second World War at a time when there was only 2 billion people on the planet. Um, You can't go on doing that. By the end of that war, we had nuclear weapons. So now you have to stop. And and there has been a conscious 60-year project of which Australia has been a part from its inception to change the rules by which we run the world so that at least the great powers stop having wars with each other. We can't get rid of all the rest right away. But if the, the great powers are the dangerous ones. If they go to war again, well, it's good night nurse, isn't it? So that's the project. And essentially what the present administration under Mr. Bush is doing is attacking it with the intention of replacing that set of rules we created with essentially Pax Americana, the American peace, the phrase they use, based on American military and economic power, on the attractive force of American ideals. We will democratize the planet. We will take care of all the bad guys. Stand back, folks. You might get hurt if you get too close. America has the knowledge, the power, the will to do this. Is the UN partially responsible for this situation? We've seen quite a, uh, an ossification of the United Nations over the years. Is the decline in the prestige, if you like, and the effectiveness of the UN created a vacuum here that the U.S. has filled? Well, in the United States, where the United Nations gets shellacked regularly by commentators left, right, and center, it's very unpopular. I mean, the problem with the United Nations and the rules it it embodies is that it cramps America's style, so you mustn't expect it to be too popular there. But, you know, has it undergone a major long-term deterioration? I'm not convinced of that. There's been corruption, certainly. There, In fact, the U.N. always had a good deal of corruption. It's just now that it's getting mentioned more than it used to. But it was always full of drunks, drones, and and political remittance men. I mean, you know, (laughs) people get sent to be ambassador to the UN because they don't want them round the home capital anymore. (laughs) But, you know, that doesn't mean it doesn't serve many useful purposes. The Security Council is out of date in the sense that it's a pure accident of history that China's a member because it was independent in 1945 and India's not on the Security Council because it wasn't independent until 1947. Otherwise, it would be. Um, But by then we'd written the rules. Um, That sort of thing is very untidy and somehow needs to be addressed. But at the core, I think the UN, which is not about doing good in the world but avoiding World War III, is still reasonably capable of doing its job. For one thing, we haven't had World War III and we're 60 years now and counting. Um, that's not bad. It's the longest period no great powers have fought one another since the beginning of modern history. So we're doing something right here. And I, I don't think that the Security Council is by any means more. But, I mean, the Security Council didn't fail when it refused to authorize the United States to invade Iraq. It succeeded. It didn't give in to American pressure. It was an illegal invasion. It was justified by what turned out later to be at least gross errors, I would say lies. Um, If the UN had gone along with the Iraq invasion, it would have betrayed its own values and principles. So I don't think it's failed. Gwindaya, some some commentators say that, and even Arab commentators will say, that the Arab world has been politically stalemated since the 1920s. Is it really so wrong for the United States and its allies to try and break that stalemate and bring democracy to Iraq? where It's the only country, Arabic country, that has any semblance of democracy now. Um, no, it's not. Um, Lebanon's got a much more credible sem- semblance of democracy, and Kuwait is getting there, and Qatar is doing a reasonable job. And uh, it's, you know, no, it's not the only Arab country, although there, there is a remarkable scarcity of large democratic Arab countries, I would fully agree. But is, is it but, so wrong but, for the United States to try and break the, the stalemate that the Arab world has been Well, in? the United States created the stalemate. Who put those regimes in power? Who's held them in power? The Saudi ruling family? The three generals who have ruled Egypt in apostolic succession over the past 50 years? I mean, Mubarak's been in power for 24 years, and Egypt gets more American foreign aid than anywhere else except Israel to keep him in power. He's our guy. 
I mean, so the idea that suddenly the United States noticed, whoops, oh, well, Middle East, look at that. What a mess. Better go and fix it. No, the United States created the mess. Well, we it had a lot of help. The Europeans were certainly in there helping for all they were worth because the Middle East happens to be where there's a lot of oil and we like to make sure it's in the hands of people we trust. But the idea that there is some mission that the United States is remotely equipped to to uh, accomplish, to bring democracy to the Middle East. A, I don't think you can, in fact, impose democracy by invasion. And B, you are not in a, an appropriate moral position suddenly to declare that these regimes have to be removed. And by the way, if you didn't like Saddam Hussein, what are you doing protecting the generals who rule Algeria and the general who rules Egypt? They're your guys, too, aren't they? You said that uh, you can't force democracy on a country by invasion, but didn't the United States do just that at the end of the Second World War in Japan and indeed in West Germany? Hasn't, that can be done. It has been done. There is a precedent for that. Well, actually, first of all, both those countries were democracies until the 1930s. I mean, not particularly impressive democracies in the case of Japan. But, you know, Japan has had a democracy yeah, for all of the 20th century, except the period when the army basically took over in the late 20s, early 30s, down to 1945. And Germany was a fully democratic country um, until Hitler came to power in 1933. So you're dealing with a slight interruption in service here when the fascists took over. And, you know, in due course, you, you know, stand them up, put them back on the road, and, and off they go. They know the tunes already. Um, but uh, the idea that you can, and also, of course, they belong to essentially the same cultural area. They have all the same points of reference. Um, we're all coming from the same origins, culturally, politically, religiously, in, in, in the case of the Germans, not religiously in the case of the Japanese, but they were a fully industrialized, modern country. You can't march into an Arab country, which is alien by religion, where almost nobody in your invading force will speak the language or have any idea about the culture, and where, as an American, you are regarded as the principal enemy of the Arabs over the past 50 years, and that is the view on the Arab street anywhere, and expect to transform that country into a modern democracy. I mean, it's, it's, I mean if, you, if you'd actually sort of stood back a moment in 2003 and said, what would be the result if the United States invades any Arab country? The answer, surely, from anybody who knows the area, would have been resistance. There's bound to be resistance. The Americans aren't trusted. They aren't loved. They aren't tremendously good at intercultural communication. And uh, there was bound to be resistance. So are you saying then, Gwendai, that if a nation is to have democracy... Its people must seize it for themselves. I actually am saying that, yes. And you will observe that about 30 countries have done precisely that over the past 20 years. Um, you know, there was once the idea um, that democracy was somehow a Western um, invention and a Western value which with great difficulty might be transplanted in one or two countries outside that Western cultural sphere. But basically, uh, they'll have to copy us, and we don't know if they really want what they, what they really want, what we want. So maybe it won't take that transplant. That, that, I mean, that view has had been kicked to pieces um, over the past 25 or 30 years. Because so you argue what, that democracy is a universal? Yes, it's a, uni it's a universal <laughs> constant. Uh, I mean, from, from the Filipino revolution, the first one in 1986, you know, Cory Aquino and all that, the overthrow of Marcos, down through the, re the revolutions that brought democracy to Thailand and Bangladesh and, and South Korea in the late 80s, democratization of Taiwan in the, in the 90s, Da, then the, the transmission to Europe, the fall of the communist regimes in Eastern Europe, the collapse of the Soviet Union itself, and the emergence of more or less democratic countries in almost all of Eastern Europe and parts of the Soviet, former Soviet Union. So, so you agree with the neocons, at least at that, that issue anyway, that uh, democracy I, is I a universal I agreed with thing. them on that long before they thought it. I mean, <laughs> they, they, they only came up with this one in the past three or four years, you know. Um, uh, but, <laughs> it's, but, it's, Quinn Dyer is my guest in the conversation now this morning. He's a renowned military historian, author, journalist and broadcaster, fascinated by the practice of war, and his most recent book is called Future Tense. Uh, John Howard, our Prime Minister, 
uh, after September 11, Gwindai, he, he remarked that we, when thinking about Al Qaeda, they don't. It's uh, talking about the issue of, of Palestine and, and Israel. It's it's not really about that for them. In their mind, they don't hate us for what we in the West do, but for who we are. Isn't that wonderful? Then you don't have to change what you do. I mean that, that that's that's really that's not even cheap. That is that is my 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 genuine response to that kind of nonsense. They don't hate us for who we are. They don't care what we do at home. It's when we go into the Middle East and or other parts of the Muslim world and start pushing them around that they care. It is about policy, not essence. Um, you know, the, the there is of course a level of rhetoric in which being religious fanatics, as the Al-Qaeda members are, they will talk about Islamizing the planet, but in fact people have been talking about Islamizing or Christianizing or whateverizing the planet ever since the large religions arose. Does, know, that constitute, they, does that constitute a genuine threat in your mind? No, of course not. I mean, you know, the, if what, 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 you will observe, for example, that the overwhelming majority of the membership of Al-Qaeda and the large majority of of Muslim countries where there is any likelihood of a religious, an extreme religious party coming to power are Arab. And yet Arabs are under a quarter of the Muslim world's population. And the reason is because the Arabs have been taking huge amounts of stick for the last 50 years and they're fed up with it and they're fed up with the West. And therefore there is a, a ready audience there, but not in, you know, Indonesia or... Uh, Bosnia or, you know, some other part of the African Muslim countries for the kind of extremism that Al-Qaeda represents. Um, but it is about, you know, events and policies and, and concrete things, not some existential hatred of the West because, oh, you know, they hate our freedoms? I mean, excuse me, they what? <laughs> they hate our freedoms. Oh, yeah, right. What do you propose the West, uh, Western powers, if you like, or the rest of the world ought to be doing to contain the threat from al-Qaeda? I would say it's pretty well contained, isn't it? I mean, uh, my, my calculation is that since 9-11, which was a dreadful event, 3,000 Americans died on a single morning then. And some Australians the, too. And uh, some Australians and, and, and so on. Um, but since then, international terrorist attacks by Islamists. And I'm not counting what's happening in Iraq because that's a self-inflicted wound. Have killed fewer than a thousand people in four years on a planet with six billion people. I would say the problem's pretty contained, wouldn't you? So we just need to remain vigilant? Do you, well, do you think you anything know, more than that needs to be done? No, not honestly. I certainly don't plan to invade anywhere over it. I mean, there never was a cause for that. I mean, Afghanistan needed to be dealt with because it had terrorist bases. And obviously, after 9-11, you're going to have to do something about that. I never had a problem with the invasion of Afghanistan. It's when they went off and invaded Iraq, which was clearly another agenda, that um, that things went weird. But in terms of, of the, the terrorist threat, I presume you drove to work this morning. You took a much bigger risk doing that than you will face over a year from terrorists. I mean, <laughs> you know, we, we need to teach people statistics of risk. This is a very small threat. Gwendai, just stepping back a bit from the conflict in Iraq at the moment and just going, looking at the more general issue of war again, how do you see the practice of war, the institution of war as you call it? Is it a kind of horrible thing uh, and that humans go through from time to time or is it is it an aberration or is it normal is war the normal state of humankind i think it probably is the normal state of humankind through all of prehistory i mean most of the evidence which doesn't mean you're doomed to do it forever um any more than you're doomed to hunt wild animals forever but um <laughs> the the um, that's not a plug for anti whatever you know. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll take that as a given. <laughs> but but uh, but all that we know about hunter gatherers uh, and much of the evidence actually comes from Australian Aboriginal groups um, suggests that they lived in a state of permanent low level war with most of their neighbours. Um, and that though the weapons were not very efficient and they didn't try very hard to kill each other a lot of the time, um, somewhere around 
a quarter to a third of adult males died of war over the long reaches of time and the broad variety of hunter-gatherer groups around the planet. I mean, so war has been with us before civilization. That seems very likely, but it's been mutated hugely as civilization grew. It's become astonishingly destructive, at least in its potential, nuclear weapons and so on. And also we have changed. I mean, you know, the people who lived in those hunter-gatherer societies never met more people in their entire lives face-to-face than you will see on a crowded bus. You know, now we live in cities million strong. If we can undergo that transformation, there's some others we might be able to undergo as well. But human nature and, doesn't really change, though, does it? Human nature doesn't. Well, I, yeah, but human nature is already so various. You have so many different behaviors, many of them contradictory, that you can call upon. Uh, in human nature that, that, you know, the fact that it doesn't change, the panoply of possible behaviors remains the same, doesn't mean that they will all get expressed in the same way forever. Um, and certainly, you know, the, as I said, you know, in hunter-gatherer groups, approximately a third to a quarter, a quarter to a third of the males, the calculations have been made by anthropologists, died in war. Well, there hasn't been a single civilized society where it's hit 10%. Um, except the ones that got hit by Genghis Khan, possibly, but not, you know, I mean, we, you know, how many adult males do you know who've died in war? We already have moved a very, very long way from that kind of situation that prevailed, let's say, in Australia 300 years ago. So, um, so what you're saying is that the human, human race, if you like, is on a, is on a a journey that we have to sort of pick up at the moment to, to, we have to to reinvent ourselves. We have to reinvent ourselves. Yeah. Can that, can that be, can that be done? Well, we've been doing it for for thousands of years already. I mean, the whole process of civilization is the reinvention. No, this is no longer a species that lives in groups of under a hundred and now lives in groups of a hundred million. Uh, no, you know, no, they don't uh, don't take slaves any longer. They've stopped doing that. Um, you know, no, this no, no, they're not hunters anymore. They're farmers. I mean, you know, we reinvent ourselves in all sorts of ways. I have to admit, Gwen, when I read this part in your book, uh, your book on war, I thought, you know, you, where you said we have to reinvent ourselves and we have to abolish this, I thought, oh, oh God, that's just not going to be possible, Gwen. But then, then you, then you uh, wrote a bit about slavery and the way we've managed to abolish that. Can you talk a bit about that, please? Well, yeah. I mean, slavery has, of course, a much older history than, than the kind of African slavery that is the, the most, most on people's minds because it's the most recent big-scale phenomenon in Western civilization. But there's been slavery since the rise of civilization, basically because once you've got farms, you need stoop labor, and most people don't like it, so it's quite handy to have slaves. And... Um, it becomes, I mean, it comes originally, it arises because, you know, you capture the enemy, you kill the men, you rape the women, and then the children are their hostages, so they have to do, they can't run away anymore, and you create a slave class, and this is how slavery arises. But then it lasts for thousands of years and is deeply entrenched in every human civilization. If you came to this planet in the 16th century, I can't imagine where you could have gone and not found slaves. It it was the thing that completely underpinned Roman civilization. Roman civilization, classical Greek civilization, pre, you know, sort of Mesopotamian, ancient Egyptian, all the rest of it, um, and right down to the 16th century. And then, in the 18th century, people decided it was wrong. And they really did. There was no economic benefit to be derived from abolishing slavery, though probably no huge economic cost for the whole society either. It was about neutral, but a lot of individuals benefited from slavery, the slave owners. But it just, people simply decided it's wrong. And, you know, actually in this case, um, Britain tended to be rather leading the pack because it was Britain that first abolished slavery in its empire and Britain that ran the patrols that stopped the slave ships sailing from Africa to the Americas in the early 19th century and so on. But, um, you know, between about 1806 and 1880, slavery was abolished in every large civilization on this planet. Now, hey, that's not bad. And it hasn't come back and nobody's worried about it coming back. We can do big things. We can get rid of slavery. We can get rid of smallpox as well, I suppose, for that matter. Yeah. We, we, we can do these things. Is that what you're saying? We can yeah. do this. Of course. We have done them. 
One of the most complex and brilliant generals of the last century, Douglas MacArthur, who spent some time in Australia, he he uh, was often caricatured as a as a character who who loved the blood and thunder of war, but he often said he was revolted by it. And he said the best way to end war is to outlaw it. This is what you're proposing, isn't it? That we should well, outlaw war. Well, actually, I'm not proposing it. We did it 60 years ago. This isn't a job to do. This is a task that has been accomplished. I mean, enforcing the law is another matter, but it is against the law to declare aggressive war, to attack another country. You are only allowed to defend yourself or to use force under the authorization authority of the United Nations to deter aggression. That's what the international law is. And although people go, yeah, but, and then they name this long list of wars between little powers, you know, A, the great powers haven't gone to war, and that's the important thing. I mean, small countries can have wars with each other, and it's a local problem. The great powers go to war, you lose the planet. Two, or B, whichever it is, I've lost track here, um... <laughs> Uh, the 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 wars that even the middle sized powers have tend now to sh- to end very quickly. They don't drag on for years. Um, they end, you know, the Arab Israeli wars, Indo Pakistani wars. They end in a month or two. Why? Because the United Nations is in there on the one hand, offering peacekeeping troops and passing resolutions, and the other and and the great powers are acting in concert, not taking sides. I mean, quite often during the Cold War they took sides, but when that sort of thing came along, they were very careful not to get drawn into a confrontation, not to allow it to drag them in in the good old way. So you know, we've done, we've made, we've had some success on this thing. And, and you know, to come to the present and the very particular reason I wrote that book, Future Tense, the United States has decided that that law must be overthrown. That, that or rather, I should say the neoconservatives, Mr. Bush's foreign policy team, and that what is needed instead is a clear field of fire in which American power will bring peace and security, but you can't have the U.N. meddling and you can't have to worry about, you know, not being allowed to invade places. I mean, you know, our judgment's good. Why don't you trust us? We'll only invade places that need to be invaded. So that's what's going on at the moment. I mean, that's the challenge that Iraq represents. Iraq was chosen, I think, as a flagship for that policy long before 9-11. Well, I know it was. I mean, the neocons were writing about it in the late 90s. Um, Gwindo, if, and, if, if the, sorry, just to jump in there, but if, yeah. the, if the project in Iraq does not succeed, does it, does it worry you that that might strike a terrible blow to the prestige of the United States and may actually hobble it from acting when it does need to act in future? Yeah, I know, but it's a bit late to think about that, isn't it? (laughs) Yes, I agree. But, you know, staying longer won't make the blow less. I mean, it just gets worse with time. Would you have left Vietnam in 1968, or would you think the United States did better by staying till 73? You know, I mean, you know, and taking two-thirds of all the casualties after they decided to leave. Um you know, the the blow to prestige is going to be there. It's going to be real. But frankly, it's less if you get out fast than if you stay longer because it's going to hurt either way. But it will get bigger as time goes on. The disaster, I mean, what I think Iraq basically has had it for the next 10, 15 years and maybe has had it within its existing borders for good. But the situation can always get worse, and another two years of American occupation definitely will make it worse. So, you know, from the Iraqi point of view, from the American point of view, get out now. And the other thing is this. The other great powers who have observed the United States breaking the rules, casting the rules aside, asserting its hegemony, have been extremely patient. They're still being extremely patient. They're not confronting or condemning the United States. Nobody's attempted to pass resolutions at the Security Council. Futile, anyway, because the U.S. would veto them. But, I mean, our whole strategy, when I say ours, I mean collectively the, 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 the French, the British, the Germans, the Russians, the Chinese, are all holding back, waiting for the American public to pull the plug on this adventure, because you know it will sooner or later. The casualties will go up. The taxes will go up. The American public's out of here. They do it all the time. They've done it four times since 1945. So, you know, everybody's being very grown up about this, not panicking. But you know, as time goes on, patience will fray. And, And the real danger here is that people in one or more 
great power capitals will decide that you really do have a rogue nation on your hand and that this isn't going to go away when Mr. Bush loses, leaves office in 2009, early 2009, that we are going to have to contain the United States. And then you get the creation of alliances, you get the rebuilding of the arms and so on in order to contain America. Are there people I don't in the want United to see that. That worries me. Are, are there people in the United States foreign policy establishment who think the same way as you on this level? Yeah, State Department's full of them. State Department's full of them. And actually, the senior ranks of the American military are full of very bright people who are deeply concerned about American foreign policy now. I mean, it, it was very, very striking that in the run-up to the war in 2003, to the invasion, sort of, you know, January, February, March of 2003, it wasn't just the intelligence people, both in the U.S. and in Britain, middle-level people, the sort of people I'd have known for a long time, and you go and have a drink and they whisper in your ear. It wasn't just them who were leaking like, you know, like taps. It was the generals who were briefing against their own government. I mean, did, did you notice that in Britain, the, act, the chief of the, the, the general staff demanded in writing an assurance from the government that invading Iraq was legal before he'd go, before he'd ordered the British forces in, because he suspected strongly it wasn't, and he had to be covered. So, no, they don't think this is bright, a bright idea at all. This is um, policy cooked up by a bunch of hotshot civilian strategists who've always been civilians and always been steeped in classic strategic thought, you know, the Rumsfelds and, and so on, um, who've been together basically since the 1980s. They all basically got their first government jobs in the Reagan administration, discovered they were the hardest of hardliners, con constituted um, some kind of loose group, and hung together even after uh, the Republicans lost power in 92 and turned into the neoconservatives of today. And, and their project's been, been germinating a long time, and they are pretty contemptuous of both the intelligence people and the military. They think they know. Gwyn Dyer, thank you for a most challenging, controversial and entertaining conversation hour. Gwyn Dyer's new book is called Future Tense.